the question I want to ask you. So, you know, in my book also, I think, uh, and you were alluding to it just now, uh, I talk about the, you know, you look back at the industrial era and one of the key things that any economist talks about is the great divergence, right? How those sets of technologies at that time and access to them, early access to them, adoption of them early leads to that great divergence chart that, you know, many of us who studied economics in the international context have looked at. And uh, what you are suggesting also seems to be alluding to a possible second great divergence. Absolutely, absolutely. But I right. think the biggest divergence will be within countries at this rate. Inequality is increasing and it uh, has in some sense uh, exploded in the United States already and we may be at the on the verge of yet another big explosion in equality look you know uh, right now if large language models turn out to be half of what some of their boosters are claiming to be then those who control them are going to have tremendous power over information and tremendous power all sorts of economic inputs data creativity information and that sector may be highly oligopolistic it may be just google and microsoft with the support of open ai or it may be three players or four players but for such an important resource that would be a tremendous concentration of wealth and power absolutely and the last time we saw such concentration of power at least one occasion when we see such concentration of power in history is the pre-world war one era and you spent a bit of time talking about that in your book. Uh, it leads to this set of choices that elites must not control uh, all the sort of metrics of power and wealth and leads to, you know, one can argue the socialist movement, um, leads to lots and lots of socio-political churn, labor movements and so on and so forth. So now if you were to look at that and try and draw some insights for today's time, how how does this get restructured, right? So if if today everything is leading towards a concentration of power, wealth, data, technology, capital, and we are seeing signs of it, and having seen how it was dealt with the last time around, at least 100 years ago, what are some of the key lessons or insights or sort of action items that we can draw uh, for today's time? Well, look, I mean, there are so many parallels. It's a little bit cheap to draw them out so much, but you know. No, but please do it. Inequality was exploding in the uh, Gilded Age uh, that started at the end of the 19th century. It was an era of technological innovations and the people who were at the forefront of it were also becoming fabulously wealthy and fabulously powerful. Carnegie, Rockefeller, but even more strikingly, what made them so powerful was that they were controlling these new industries that had systemic importance for the economy as a whole. Oil and transport, That's those right. were services and goods on which the rest of the economy depended. It was moving. That's right. That's right. And one can and, argue even finance, right? Banks. And one even can finance. Argue the JP Morgan and absolutely. Uh, JP Morgan, and, correct. Uh, and that had become a tremendously concentrated and tremendously powerful industry as well. And that advantage was feeding into more and more inefficiencies in the economy. To make things worse, we had a fairly corrupt politics where Congress people and senators were bought and sold. There were limits on democracy, for example, direct elections of uh, senators had not been introduced yet many limits on the tools that the federal government had. You know, there was no federal reserve. There was uh, no proper income tax. There was limited set of instruments for regulation. And media was often in the hands of very rich tycoons as well. So you can say this was the time when it would be very difficult for democracy to work and for the larger than life characters to be brought under control. But at the end, the progressive movement, muckrakers and others from society's uh, heart really managed to do that. And they did that by changing the narrative, laying it bare upon the people that, you know, these very, very wealthy individuals who had become also, you know, media celebrities uh, for their day were actually abusing their power and uh, 
and influencing politics, suppressing their workers and wages, uh, you know, destroying rivals unfairly. They helped build countervailing powers and new institutions such as the labor movement. And they also led to the adoption of specific policies, including in the financial domain, including into anti-regulations and so on. And in fact, in the book, Simon Johnson and I draw parallels into the current age, turning this into a sort of uh, a recipe for what needs to be done. But on the other hand, I think there are, you know, some may say, well, today we are much more enlightened, we are much more educated, we have much more information at our fingertips, our democracy is more direct and, and, and yeah. healthy. But actually, I don't think so. I think there is a sense in which things are harder today because tech barons have a much greater lock on our information and narrative than the expression of our views did. great right exactly so today it's not tanks it's not jackboots that are the threat against democracy it is control over information and persuasion power monopoly over persuasion power that's what we argue in the book